Welcome to Night School. My name is Ryan White. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and uh, Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. And although we're not at the Academy tonight, it is the third Thursday of the month. And this is a night that we would typically be presenting a program we call the Universe Update. It's a chance to highlight some of the most recent discoveries in astronomy from the past month and to take a trip through a virtual universe built up through a, an amazingly accurate uh, model of the universe. So normally this takes place in the 75 foot diameter planetarium dome, but tonight it's going to be streaming directly to you. And although we don't normally allow drinks in the planetarium, tonight you can enjoy whatever libation you want. And even better, you can interrupt me and ask questions as we take our flight through the universe and highlight some of the most recent news. So actually to help me out with some of those questions, because I'm going to be busy piloting through our 3D model of the universe, uh, I'd like to introduce Josh Roberts. He's going to moderate and try to help uh, field any questions that come up. Uh, but uh, you're not really going to see much of either of us because we <laughs> want to share the most beautiful imagery uh, from space with you. So we're going to actually start out uh, not too far from home in orbit around Earth at the International Space Station. So uh, with that uh, image in front of you, you can see the International Space Station, kind of a nice place to start these programs because it's human scaled. Uh, and as I said, I'm actually going to be piloting. So at points, you'll see my cursor here on the on the uh, screen. Uh, I actually need to do that to pilot because uh, I pilot old school with a mouse. And uh, I can also use it to point things out. So if you can imagine, humans fit on board the International Space Station. We have astronauts up there right now. And if you can uh, think about a football field and nice thing is whether you're European or American, a football field is close enough to the same length that you can think of that as about the size of the International Space Station. Now the thing is that's as far as humans go out into space these days. Uh, we used to travel farther, but most importantly tonight, we're going to be able to travel as far as we want because we're going to be piloting not through real space, limited by the laws of physics, but instead piloting through a virtual model of the universe. So to that end, I'm going to pull away from the International Space Station. It looks like it's sort of plummeting uh, into Australia there. It's not. Uh, instead, it's just that we're pulling away from our location in orbit around Earth. And now you can see this model of, the, uh, of Earth uh, with a kind of yellow trajectory um, highlighting the location of the International Space Station. Again, we're going to travel a lot farther than that during the course of our program. Uh, but I want to just give a little bit of an introduction to the distances that we'll be using. Uh, astronomers like to use light travel time as a bit of a yardstick. So, for example, uh, we're now showing uh, the orbit of Earth's moon around our planet. Uh, and although I previously said we were uh, hanging out with the International Space Station, that's a few hundred miles, a few hundred kilometers above the surface of Earth, uh, the moon is a lot farther away. 
It's about 240,000 miles, about 400,000 kilometers, if you prefer more civilized units. And that is a big enough number that I mean, you can maybe imagine if you have a car for quite a while, you could drive it that far. But the uh, astronomers who talk about these distances all the time like to use different measures. So uh, if you think about light, it travels at the same speed uh, through the vacuum of space. And so we can talk about light travel time as a way of measuring distances. The distance then from Earth to the moon uh, is about a second and a half, give or take, of the light travel time. So we call that one and a half light seconds. Light travels at a constant speed of about 186,000 miles per second, or about 400,000 kilometers per, 300, sorry, 300,000 kilometers per second. So again, about a second and a half to travel from Earth to the moon or vice versa. So when you look up in the sky and you see a full moon, you're seeing it as it was about a second and a half ago. Now, as it pull farther away, we're going to actually reveal the orbit of Earth around the sun. And the next kind of uh, measurement using our light travel time as a, as a yardstick uh, is the distance from Earth to the sun. That's about eight and a half minutes of light travel time. So if you want to think about that second and a half from Earth to the moon as a brief pause in conversation, then eight and a half minutes is more like a quick drink at nightlife or maybe a quick lunch uh, if, you're, uh, if you're not at nightlife. I'm going to come back to those distances uh, as we go through uh, the program, and uh, that, that yardstick of light travel time is going to come in handy. Uh, but first, I'd actually like to, as I said, I'm going to highlight some, uh, some news stories from the past month. And I'm going to actually focus on stories about extrasolar planets, so planets that are in orbit around other stars. There's some other stories I'm throwing in there as well, uh, but uh, this morning we had a chance to talk about a different set of stories, so I want to keep things uh, original for tonight's program. And to put extrasolar planets in context, I want to mention something that uh, we like to call uh, the habitable zone, or, you know, some people prefer the Goldilocks zone. That's a distance from the sun where water can exist, liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet, basically a planet the size of Earth. So it's a little bit of a biased kind of measure. We're going to highlight it as sort of this green band encircling the sun. So basically, if you're too close to the sun, uh, and actually if, like, you know, if you remember from elementary school, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the four terrestrial planets, the planets closest to the sun. Mercury and Venus are too close to the sun for liquid water to persist on their surface. Earth, interestingly, is just kind of on the inside of that uh, habitable zone, the way it's currently defined. So just as a warning, we should probably think about wanting to make our planet any warmer than it already is because the radiation from the sun, heat from the sun, uh, is really kind of already uh, toward the high end for maintaining liquid water uh, on the surface in a, in a hospitable way for life. And then Mars, interestingly, uh, is uh, at about the right distance from the sun for liquid water, but it turns out Mars itself is kind of tiny. Uh, so it's not so good for holding on to liquid water that we believe life requires, or at least the life as we know it requires uh, to exist. So the habitable zone is this interesting kind of tool for talking about potential habitability of planets that we find around other stars, but it's a limited concept. So to underscore that, uh, let me go ahead and take down our, our image of the habitable zone. I'd actually like to target a different place in our solar system outside the habitable zone. So remember, Mars was just on the kind of outside of the habitable zone, on the cool side of things. Uh, but uh, Jupiter out here, the largest planet in our solar system, is home to numerous moons. And one of them in particular is potentially a great place, we think, to look for life, even though it's well outside the habitable zone. So let me just take you there briefly. Uh, and there's another reason I want to introduce kind of the Jupiter system to you, because as we get close to Jupiter, we're going to fade up some more orbit lines. These are the orbits of Jupiter's moons around this giant planet, the largest planet in our solar system, uh, a planet that um, is actually a thousand times more massive than Earth. It's kind of a heavyweight in the solar system. Uh, and the orbits that we are showing here I want you to keep that kind of scale in mind. It's relatively small compared to the size of the solar system, but we're going to visit a place in the universe that's actually very similar in size uh, to this sort of Jupiter system with its moons. Uh, but the moon I want to take you in close to visit is a moon called Europa. Now, 
Ryan, before we get to Europa, we had some oh, folks sure. asking about the positions of objects in this software. Are they oh, yeah. accurate to where things would actually be? Short answer is yes. Now, I have to admit that I cheated a little bit. I set the time on our simulation a little bit early because uh, if we were looking at where the space station is now, it would be on the nighttime side of Earth. I decided that was a little boring and a little dark. So I actually turned the clock back so that the, uh, so that the International Space Station would appear in an appealing location on Earth. Uh, so we are looking at an accurate representation of where Jupiter's moons sort of would have been or were uh, about a uh, half hour, 45 minutes ago. So uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a cheat, but uh, the location of, uh, of the uh, objects in our, in our interplanetary and interstellar atlas is as accurate as we can represent them. And yes, there is a kind of time-based component to that uh, so that we you know, have planets orbiting their stars in appropriate, uh, at the appropriate rate and things like that. So let me go ahead and actually take us to Europa. It's the um, sort of third of the large moons uh, outside uh, uh, of, sorry, really the second of the large moons uh, in orbit around Jupiter. Um, but what I wanted to point out is uh, that Europa, Europa has this uh, sort of lovely and interesting surface. Now you'll notice, and actually this is a great way of underscoring that we are using data in our representation of the universe. You'll notice that some portions of this are higher resolution than others. And that's because as Europa was mapped over numerous missions, the maps that we've used to create this were at different resolutions. And so not every part of Europa was mapped with the same precision as other parts. So we're actually representing the data that we have about this amazing, intriguing moon, Europa. Now, Europa is the source of constant speculation about being a good place to look for life because underneath Europa's surface, it has a vast ocean. So let me actually um, do something we can do in the planetary, we're in our software here, and that is actually to give you a look inside Europa. So we're actually going to cut away a portion of our moon uh, and reveal what's going on inside. We know from the spacecraft that have orbited uh, Jupiter and have interacted gravitationally with, uh, with Europa that uh, it has a vast underwater ocean that surrounds the entire moon. Now, Europa is a pretty large moon, uh, and, uh, and this, the ocean itself is maybe about 100 kilometers deep, no, it's 60 miles, call it deep. Uh, and the layer of ice that completely covers uh, Europa is maybe about 10 kilometers, um, about, so about a tenth that, might be a little bit thicker. Um, what we, but we're, we're pretty certain about that thickness of the, of the combination of water and ice, but the relative thickness of the ice versus the kind of liquid or maybe slushy water uh, is, uh, is where we're not quite as sure. Um, the, uh, and then the interior of the, of the moon uh, has a, a rocky core. What has tantalized uh, observers of EO is the chance to look for some of this water potentially escaping from Europa. And we see this at another moon, a moon of Saturn called Enceladus. We see plumes of material ejected from the South Pole, around the South Pole of Enceladus. So people speculate that maybe something similar is happening in Europa. We don't have a spacecraft in orbit around, well, we do have a spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter. It's not passing by close enough to Europa to make the kind of observations that would be required to understand what's going on. So we've dug back into the archives of different spacecraft, and then we've made observations with telescopes here on Earth. So using that combination of tools, there are some interesting candidates when we think that maybe uh, Europa has sort of ejected a plume of material. And then just this month, uh, confirmation from uh, a group of astronomers. Now, unfortunately, not an additional observation, but rather looking back at this historical collection of observations, suggests that the only way to explain the observations is, in fact, if Europa has been uh, emitting water out into space, or that something uh, from that vast interior ocean is escaping out into space. So Europa, again, Brian. yes. The moment you mentioned potential for life, we've got a bunch of folks who are very interested. Uh, sure when thing. we talk about life-like conditions there, is there anything that could survive here that if we dropped off with some food on Europa would survive there? Alexandra wants to know. Yeah, that's a great question because uh, we, um, there, there could, well, 
First off, the thing to understand about Jupiter is that this giant planet has an equally sort of giant magnetic field. And that magnetic field is filled with charged particles. The overall environment uh, close in to, to Jupiter is not hospitable to life like us. You uh, would not survive very long if you were plopped down on the surface of Europa. And in fact, if you were plopped down on the surface of Europa, even with a, a good NASA-approved uh, spacesuit, it might only last perhaps a couple hours. So first off, any life on a surface would have to be very resilient to that kind of uh, interaction with radiation from, uh, from Jupiter's uh, magnetic fields. That said, that thick layer of ice is a good layer of protection. So if, uh, if that provides enough protection from that magnetic field, um, we have the additional benefit that the ocean underneath uh, Europa's icy surface is very likely warmed by uh, the gravitational interaction of Europa with Jupiter. So uh, it might be that uh, there are temperatures underwater, under that icy crust, where life could exist in, uh, although the exact chemistry in that is a lot more confusing, since of course we're sort of hypothesizing about what kind of life could exist in a place like Europa. Uh, it, it's not terribly dissimilar from uh, from places on Earth, like maybe like Antarctica, although again, a lot less hospitable in terms of the radiation environment and potentially even much colder and things like that. And I should just underscore that if we're looking for life, we're not gonna find polar bears or fish or anything like that. It would be microbial life, microscopic life uh, that sort of has the potential to exist uh, on a place like Europa. So again, I just wanna underscore um, Remember this scale here of the of the distance across uh, these four uh, four giant moons of Jupiter, because uh, I'm going to reference it a, a little bit later when we visit some of the other uh, places along our, our trip tonight. And now, as we pull away from our solar system once again, I want to come back to that uh, that cosmic measuring stick, the uh, the way that we talked about measuring distance in terms of light travel time, because uh, the um, the Orbits of the eight planets that you see here, uh, and uh, since uh, uh, I guess it's not a requirement to be over 21 if you're at nightlife uh, here at home, uh, but normally at nightlife it's 21 and up, so I can say with some assurance that everyone learned in grade school that there were nine planets, uh, the not so long ago demoted Pluto, uh, which uh, would be outside the orbit of Neptune here for the most part, is, uh, is another good kind of measuring rod uh, because it's a little bit, its orbit is a little bit uh, wider than Neptune's orbit here. Sorry, just as again, we have the reminder, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars down close to the sun. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, are the outer planets. Neptune's orbit is a little less than eight light hours across. So it takes light about a little less than eight hours to cross from one side of Neptune's orbit to the other. And, uh, and that's, again, kind of a useful measure. So again, if the uh, uh, if the distance from Earth to the, to the Moon is about a second and a half, a brief pause in conversation, distance from Earth to the Sun, eight and a half minutes, a quick drink at nightlife, eight hours, well, that's uh, uh, maybe a good night's sleep, if you want to think about it in terms of a human time scale. Now, for comparison, the nearest star is about four light years away, so that's a huge contrast. If you think about a good night's sleep versus a uh, high school or college education, that gives you a sense of the difference in scale between uh, interplanetary distances and interstellar distances. So in order to study these objects that are outside our solar system, we really need to uh, have a whole new way of exploring. I say a new way, but really it's the way that we've been exploring the cosmos for centuries, which is by studying light from distant objects. The reason we need to rely on light is because Although we've built very fast spacecraft to explore our own solar system, they haven't gotten very far. I'm highlighting here the locations of uh, uh, the trajectories, I should say, of five, the five fastest spacecraft that we've launched out into the universe. These five spacecraft are all traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravitational pull. They're basically traveling at escape velocity from our solar system. Now, four of the five were launched back in the 70s. So after almost 50 years, 40 some odd years, you can see how far these have traveled. And again, this kind of underscores the fact that we are using 
uh, the, uh, the temporal component of our simulation to, uh, to represent accurately where things are in our solar system. So after 40 some odd years, the four of the five fastest objects that we've launched out into space, you can see how far they've traveled. And since we know that the diameter of our solar system is measured, give or take, by Neptune's orbit is about eight light hours, you can see that none of these spacecraft have traveled as far as light travels in a single day. So our spacecraft, our nuts and bolts objects sent out to explore the universe, like in C2, are not capable of telling us about the objects that we're going to be talking about as we get farther and farther out into the universe. So let me go ahead and leave our sun behind, and I'll just note that we actually have uh, increased the brightness of the sun to match the way we're displaying uh, the brightness of other stars. And let me go ahead now and take us to a planetary system that has intrigued astronomers since its discovery uh, a few years ago, about three years ago. Uh, and that is TRAPPIST-1. Uh, I'll just show you a little marker here to highlight its location. Uh, it's pretty close to home, and uh, what's amazing about TRAPPIST-1 is that it has uh, not one, not two, not three, not four, but five, not six, but seven Earth-sized planets in orbit around this really kind of uh, tiny, really tiny star. Uh, the star kind of oops, disappeared there for a moment. Um, but... Uh, as we get close to the system, notice that the orbits of the planets, we basically flew directly from the sun to TRAPPIST-1. And notice that the orbits of the planets are all kind of in a line. That is because we discovered these planets by their transit in front of, basically in between, their parent star and us. So looking at the star, we see little dips in brightness. And that dip in brightness corresponds to a planet's shadow basically moving across the diameter of the star. This is a complicated system because, in fact, the seven planets all orbiting relatively close to their parent star make for a very challenging combination of dips in brightness as they pass uh, in between us and the star. And so it's take, it took a while to disentangle, but with observations from Spitzer Space Telescope and other uh, instruments, we're able to determine that TRAPPIST-1 has these seven rather Earth-sized planets in orbit around them. Now, what's interesting about what was announced this past week is that this is a very, uh, this is a wonderful system to study because uh, there's, it doesn't seem to have uh, interacted with things in its past. It looks like it's a sort of pristine system. So it could tell us about how planetary systems form, a theme that I can come back to later in the show. And uh, and I'll just note as well um, that, in fact, I should say that uh, if you if you go to the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page last week, we had a chance to talk to Robert Hurt from the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, education team about this system and uh, and how uh, the observations with Spitzer were able to tell us so much about the system. But basically, because all of these planets are pretty good sized compared to not only their parent star, but to one another, and they're all kind of close in to one another, they have a lot of interaction with each other. And so it's been able to really pin down the masses and sizes of these planets with incredible precision. And so just to remember, I pointed out that diameter from of the, of the outer, uh, the four uh, giant planets, sorry, giant moons of Jupiter. If uh, Jupiter were, if you replaced the, the TRAPPIST-1 star with Jupiter, uh, all of the four of those orbits would just neatly fit inside sort of that inner orbit of, uh, of that innermost planet. So this is a very tiny, compact system. And the observations that were announced this past week uh, indicate that all of the planets are revol re rotating the same direction they're revolving in very much in the same plane as the, uh, as the star and, and with the same uh, rotation as the star. Now, this is basically just saying that if you can imagine, uh, and you can kind of tell what direction these are going because of the way we're drawing these lines, everything is sort of circling this way. This, the inner star is also rotating like that. All of the planets are rotating in the same direction. This is pretty much what's happening in our solar system, but we found planetary systems that don't look like that at all. And so it's, it's encouraging to find that the TRAPPIST-1 system is consistent uh, with these observations because it's, it tells us that our, our understanding of planetary formation is pretty much on the right track. That planets form from disks of material uh, that uh, revolve around their parent star 
with individual planets forming inside the disk. That's how we think our solar system formed. That looks like how TRAPPIST has formed, uh, TRAPPIST-1 has formed. And I'll show you an image of a planetary, bleh, planetary system forming uh, as we go a little farther along in the show. Brian, before we blast off too far from TRAPPIST-1, sure. uh, how does it stack up to our star? Is it going to be older, younger? How do they compare? Uh, it's a good question about age. I am uh, fairly certain, uh, although I, without looking it up right now, I wouldn't be able to say for sure. The TRAPPIST-1 is a much younger star. Uh, the TRAPPIST-1 star is actually it's barely even a star. Uh, it's really almost closer to a brown dwarf in terms of its mass and its luminosity. Uh, so it's really at the it's at the tail end of tiny stars. Um, I should note too that tomorrow morning at 11:30 a.m. we're going to have a chance to talk to uh, to Jackie Faraday, who's an expert on brown dwarfs, and uh, and we actually might talk a little bit more about this system. Uh, so if uh, if we don't find an answer and publish it in the comments uh, for tonight, uh, it's definitely a great question for Jackie uh, uh, tomorrow morning. One last one. Is it possible that TRAPPIST has other planets that are off the plane of the ecliptic that we just haven't found? So that's a great question. It certainly seems, it's certainly conceivable. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not an observation that would be easy to make since all of the planets that we've discovered, we've discovered through the transit technique. Um, but I would say that uh, with TRAPPIST, it is a, because the star itself is so tiny, uh, I would expect that if there is some sort of massive planet that's much farther away, uh, then it would show a gravitational influence on the star that we're, we're not seeing at this point. Um, and, uh, and so it, I certainly would think it's unlikely, but it's certainly conceivable. Well, in the interest of time, I might just take us to one other kind of intriguing system. Um, and it's another way of kind of underscoring how well we have studied uh, some of these planetary systems. This is a, a, a system called KELT-9. Uh, the, uh, it actually, uh, KELT is uh, not indicative of any Irish ancestry uh, of, the, uh, of the star or its planetary system, uh, but uh, it is one of the, the better acronyms uh, that, uh, that astronomers have come up with uh, as we get closer here to the star. The star itself is actually quite a bit brighter uh, it's a pretty big size star uh, compared to our sun even. Uh, and it's sort of, you can see it's kind of a bluish color. Um, but uh, just to note that, uh, 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 oh yeah, I was talking about the, the KELT acronym. KELT actually stands for Kilo Degree Extremely Little Telescope. Now in an era when so many telescopes are called very large, extremely large, ridiculously large, all of the acronyms that get fun, made fun of in things like XKCD, it's actually really cool to have uh, an extremely little telescope uh, acknowledged. But it's because uh, the star uh, KELT-9 is actually fairly bright that uh, this extremely little telescope was able to observe this extraordinary planet uh, in orbit around it. Now, KELT-9b, which is the name of the planet, uh, is uh, very well studied because it actually orbits its parent star about once every 36 hours. That means that uh, it, we can make very frequent observations of them, of, uh, of KELT-9. Similar to uh, the, uh, the way that TRAPPIST was discovered. This was discovered through a transit technique. So we saw the shadow of the planet uh, passing in between us and its parent star. But uh, the recent, um, and, oh, it's just to give you a sense of scale, this is about three times uh, the mass of Jupiter. Uh, but it's about twice the uh, diameter. So it's actually a lot puffier than Jupiter, uh, a lot less dense. Uh, and we actually think that its atmosphere is being stripped away from the intense radiation and heat from its parent star. What uh, was announced just this past week, however, is that they have a detection of iron in the atmosphere uh, of this planet. And that's a pretty extraordinary measurement because in order to do it, they had to not just look at the shadow of the planet passing between us and the star. They actually had to look at the illuminated part of the planet. So they had to actually look at it and it was very close to it. It's an extremely bright star. And this is a really challenging observation, but it shows that it's kind of indicative of the amazing sort of tools that astronomers are deploying in order to understand how planetary systems are taking shape. So a lot of planets look very, very different from our own 
uh, our own solar system. So even though Kelt 9 is uh, bigger and puffier than Jupiter, it's much, much hotter uh, because it's heated by the light of its, uh, its pretty uh, enormous parent star. Uh, and it's a, it's a planet very unlike anything uh, we'd find in our solar system. So I want to make um, one last sort of stop here uh, in our galaxy, and then um, given the time, we can either do some more Q&A or we can see about traveling farther out of our galaxy to uh, the uh, cosmic microwave background, which is a way that I like to end all of my shows, but it uh, does take a little bit of extra time. Where I wanted to take you in this uh, to kind of complete the story of how planetary systems take shape is to uh, visit um, an object called AB Auriga. Now, this image was just released in the past uh, in the past week or so, uh, but I want to take you to the system. It's a few hundred a uh, few hundred light years from home, and this. Uh, uh, AB Auriga is a, a system that is forming planets right now. And so I mentioned that, uh, that some of these observations of TRAPPIST-1 uh, are indicative of how uh, the, that planetary system took shape. Um, and I'll just forgive this kind of sparkly stuff happening off to the side there. It's a, a problem the computer has sometimes when we get too close to certain objects. Uh, but this, this gaseous... Uh, object that we're seeing here is the, the disk of material around a parent star that we're not seeing. And deep inside, uh, where these kind of swirls are seen, uh, and I apologize, the computer is sort of making this dance around a little bit more than I intended. Uh, the, this kind of structure is something that we see in a lot of computational simulations of how planets form. And so we think that we're actually seeing a planet taking shape around this star uh, hundreds of light years from home. And to give you a sense of scale, uh, this is about the distance of, from the center as, uh, as Neptune is from the sun. So what we're seeing here is uh, our entire solar system would fit inside this inner portion uh, of, uh, of AB Auriga. Uh, but this is an incredible image that uh, is uh, part of this story of how planets take shape uh, and so as we've found now thousands of extrasolar planets, we're now beginning to piece together the story of how planets form. And, uh, and that in turn helps us understand uh, our own history, how the, our solar system formed and, uh, and how Earth itself took shape. So with that, I'm going to pull far enough away that we're actually going to exit our collection of stars of hundreds of billions of stars called the Milky Way galaxy. I don't know if we have any other questions kind of queued up or if I should just go ahead and take us on a quick trip to round out our tour of the universe. We have people who are very interested in going all the way out. All right. Well, then let's do that. So here we're seeing the uh, Milky Way galaxy. Um, the sun is, uh, is about, um, uh, I don't know exactly where the sun is, but it's give or take. It's about, out, um, well, it's definitely not there. So... It's either here or here. So the sun is about uh, 35,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. And the galaxy itself is a little over 100,000 light years across. So to recall where we started our use of uh, light as a cosmic measuring stick, we started with a second and a half from Earth to the moon, eight and a half minutes to the sun, four years. So it's still a pretty comfortable human time scale to the nearest star. Now we're talking about 35,000 years from the, from the sun's location to the center of the Milky Way, 35,000 years ago, we were, humanity was painting the insides of caves. 100,000 years ago, equivalent to the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy, our species hadn't even left Africa. So this is a really kind of mind-boggling point now when we start to confront the fact that this concept of light travel time, which is so nice and kind of easy to wrap our hands, heads around initially, uh, gets more and more challenging. And as we leave our Milky Way behind, I'll just note that the uh, individual points of light that we're seeing here are not stars anymore. Every one of these points represents an individual galaxy. Now, our galaxy, again, 100,000 light years across, includes hundreds of billions of stars. So every one of these points that you see off in the distance 
is sort of similar in size with uh, a galaxy that contains hundreds of billions, perhaps for some of the larger ones, even a trillion stars. And what I want to call your attention to is the galaxies are not sort of uniformly distributed out in space. Instead, they clump and cluster together. Uh, notably, you can see this cluster of red dots. That's the Virgo cluster. That's the ne so nearby uh, cluster of galaxies. And uh, if you want to think of that as something like downtown San Francisco, then our own collection of uh, a few dozen galaxies, the local group of galaxies, is more like Colma. Uh, the, uh, so we don't live in the busiest part of the intergalactic neighborhood, but uh, what you can see is that clumping of clustering in galaxies, and I should note too that the galaxies aren't actually color-coded like this. The astronomer Brent Tully, who assembled uh, all of these uh, galaxy positions, uh, is the one who color-coded them in order to understand the relationships to one another. The, uh, these galaxies clump and cluster together in a way that was actually hinted at um, from our observations of the most distant parts of the universe, the oldest light in the universe. So let me just quickly kind of round out this trip to the cosmic microwave background so that we can uh, go back to a few more questions. And so now we pulled far enough away that, again, each one of these dots represents an individual galaxy, a collection of hundreds of billions of stars. And we have mapped galaxies at incredible distances out from uh, our home on Earth in the Milky Way uh, down at the center of this three-dimensional image. Now, you'll notice that the uh, galaxies are kind of forming these strands that we're passing through. And there are regions kind of down here, for example, in the lower left and upper right, where we don't see many galaxies at all. And it's not because there are no galaxies there. It's just that we haven't mapped that part of the universe yet. This map that we're showing, this three-dimensional map, does not include uh, those parts of the universe because we haven't had a chance to make those measurements. As we pull farther away, we're fading up more points that kind of lie along the same plane because they're part of the same survey. But these individual points represent the bright cores of young galaxies, what we call quasars. And quasars are something that we don't see close to home. And this is where we really start to confront one of the big ideas of that finite travel, uh, that finite speed of light travel time. Because light travels at a finite speed, as we look out into space, we look back into time. And the reason we don't see quasars close to home is because they only existed billions of years in the past in an earlier epoch in the history of the universe. So when we look out in space and look back into time, we're now looking back billions of years into the past. And the punchline for this is the image that I kind of accidentally brought up a little earlier and that's what we call the cosmic microwave background. This is not like other images I've shown you during the course of the show. It's a little bit more like a heat map. And the bright parts of the image correspond to hot regions, the dark parts to cool regions. And this is a baby picture of the universe. We're seeing light that it was emitted when the universe was only at a few hundred thousand years old. And the universe is now about 13.8 billion years old. So the universe was very young indeed when this light was emitted. But what's amazing is that the dark blotches and the bright blotches correspond to, that would be my mouse falling to the ground, correspond to variations in not only temperature, but density in the early history of the universe. And that variation in temperature and density led to the formation of the clusters of galaxies that we see close to home. It turns out that variation early in the history of the universe, when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old, is tiny. The dark parts are only about one part in a hundred thousand times uh, denser than the bright parts. Uh, the bright parts are only about one part in a hundred thousand times hotter than the, cool, the darker cool parts. And yet that tiny variation in temperature and density led to the formation of structure close to home. So uh, let me go ahead and take us back home. But as I do, I just want to mention one last thing. Uh, you'll notice, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, that we sort of appear to be at the center of the universe. The three-dimensional model that I've been showing you is centered on us, on the Earth. Now, that's a little deceptive because, in fact, we are not the center of the universe. No, lots of us would like to think so, but we're not. And 
it's just because we are the ones drawing the picture. We are the ones who are mapping these objects and their distance from us. So we end up at the center of the universe. Uh, and it's actually the center of the universe in the here and the now, while the cosmic and microwave background is billions of years in the past, billions of light years distant. And these quasars and galaxies are similarly far back in space, far out in space and far back in time. Well, that let me go ahead and dive back down toward home, back through the candy colored galaxies that are relatively close to us toward our Milky Way galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars in our home galaxy. And in toward the thousands of stars nearby and maybe finally to our sun and the orbits of the planets around it. So we'll end up here at the uh, third rock from the sun, Earth. And I want to thank you for joining me on this uh, night school tour of the universe and universe update. Uh, if you have any questions, I think I'm hearing that we have quite a few. You have quite uh, a few questions. <laughs> then, uh, then I'm more than happy to take a stab at answering them. Okay. I wanted to give a big shout out to everybody watching on our multiple platforms, doing a fantastic job answering each other's questions, even with citations, proving that we have the best fans. Wow. Uh, but one question that came up from a lot of different folks, but specifically Douglas, what kind of software are we using and how can folks do something like this at home? That's great. Yeah, the, uh, the software we're using is called Uniview, and it's kind of a bespoke software platform used by planetariums. Uh, it's not really available to just uh, anybody. Um, so unfortunately, we can't really share this directly. However, mm -hmm. there are some other great software platforms available that, uh, that people can download uh, for free or for low cost. One that we also use in the planetarium and actually for streaming events as well, and Josh is actually pretty much an expert in it, is OpenSpace. It's an open source platform developed by NASA in collaboration with the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And, uh, and that is uh, still kind of in the early days. I would say it's, uh, it's beyond beta, but it's still got uh, a little bit of a learning cur curve that's a little steep to climb sometimes. But it offers a lot of the same data that you saw uh, in the program tonight. And there's also a great piece of software called Worldwide Telescope, another uh, free open source platform that's uh, sponsored by the American Astronomical Society. That's a really cool tool to use to explore these kind of data. And someone asked about Linux. I think they might even have a Linux worldwide, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, uh, um, Worldwide Telescope. Uh, well, Worldwide Telescope runs uh, for a lot of features as in a web browser. Uh, it's actually HTML5 compatible, so you can actually do a lot in your browser. Uh, if you want to run the full-up software, unfortunately, it's Windows only. Uh, and Open Space is multi-platform. I don't know about Linux, but it does it runs yeah, all right on a Mac, uh, and it runs a lot better on Windows. Okay, another question that's come up every single planetarium show we give, aliens, are they out there? What are they gonna be like? So uh, if I were to place a bet, um, although I don't think I'd ever have to pay it out in my lifetime, I would bet that life exists in the universe around us. Now, I would hedge my bet a little bit by saying that life is most likely microscopic, kind of like we said on Europa, it's not a good place for whales or penguins or anything that we might find on Earth, but it's a place where microbial life could potentially take root. So I think that probably even in our solar system, there is a good chance that we would find life. But when you look at the hundreds of billions of stars that are out there, and now that we know in the past couple of decades that planets are in fact plentiful, it seems hard to believe that there's not a place where life has arisen uh, at least to achieve kind of the microbial state. But more likely green stuff under a rock than Vulcans. And probably not coming to Earth to create crop circles or eviscerate cattle. Hopefully they got better things to do. Uh, for yeah. folks who want to take this shelter in place as an opportunity to learn, I know you are a great fan of space books, Ryan. Uh, what would you recommend for someone who wants to learn more about these subjects? Um, uh, there's wow, there's sort of uh, too many to name. I do think that uh, um, a writer who's really uh, who's 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 come out with a, a few books in the past decade or so, uh, who's just got a great style is Chris Impey, uh, I M P E Y. 
wonderful writer and i'm blanking on the names of his books right now of course uh, oh, but oh, uh, but I, I think his uh, his work is really great he's got things about the beginning of the universe the end of the universe uh and then i have to say uh there you go uh, the uh um uh carl sagan's cosmos uh and also pale blue dot i think are two books that are just absolute classics in terms of uh, thinking about our place in the universe and really more broadly than just the astronomical content. I mean, Cosmos is, is nearly 40 years old now, but it's, uh, it's perspective on astronomy and thinking about the universe is really uh, eye-opening. I suppose it's hard to go wrong with Sagan. And for web resources, they can tune into the Facebook page. I know there's a lot of cool stuff coming through there. Absolutely. So the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page uh, we put up stories every so often, and more and more frequently, we're doing programs like this, where we're streaming live uh, with more and more opportunities to answer questions of the entire planetarium staff. Uh, and then we also share lots of cool stories as they come out. So it's a good place to, to keep tabs on things. Okay, thank you so much, Ryan. And all on right. behalf of the audience, I think we all really enjoyed the program. It was really fun to follow along. Absolutely. And thank you, Josh, for fielding all the questions and helping out tonight. Appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your night and stay happy, stay healthy, and shelter as long as you can. Night.